Good morning. This is the February 15, 2023 meeting of the Western Region Board of Review. The time is 9 01 and the hearing is officially open. The members of the board are myself, David Flynn, Richard Andrews, John Shenney, and Peter Klein Kleeman. Uh, I am the acting chairman for today's meeting, and John Lydon is not with us today. Andy Bizdag from the uh, Department of State is here, as is Thomas DeTulo. We will now hear the scheduled petitions. When you speak, please address the board and give your name, title, and legal address so that our court reporter can have all the information requested. We may have to stop from time to time to consult with our technical staff. In making comments to the board, please provide a descriptive narrative on matters referring to your exhibits to enable the court reporter to enter these into the record. The first hearing today is in the matter of the petition number 2023-0009. The petitioner is Cedarland Development Group. Uh, Peter Kleeman, a member of the board, is recusing himself from consideration of this matter. Um, that results in the three remaining members here today having to reach a unanimous decision on a variance, just so everyone is aware of that, particularly the petitioner. If you have a problem with that, we can reschedule your hearing. But if you're prepared to proceed, uh, please come up and make your presentation. I'm just, I'm just going to read some uh, information here. So the nature of grievance and relief sought. The petition requests a variance regarding alterations and change of occupancy to an existing building. This application is for a building type 2D of group R2F-1 slash I-4 occupancy. The building consists of three stories and has a gross area of approximately 49,607 square feet. The building is located at 950 Broadway, City of Buffalo, County of Erie, State of New York. The petition seeks relief from 19 NYCRR 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York State, F705.8 openings. Openings in exterior walls shall comply with section 705.8.1 through 705.8.6. Also, 705.8.1, allowable area of openings. The maximum area of unprotected and protected openings permitted in an exterior wall in any story of a building shall not exceed the percentages specified in table 705.8 based on the fire separation distance of each individual story. Petitioner requests relief from the allowable provision provisions of table 705.8. Also 19 NYCRR 1227, the 2020 existing building code of New York State, F 1011.7.2 stairways where a change of occupancy classification is made to a higher hazard category as shown in table 1011.4, interior stairways shall be enclosed as required by the building code of New York State. Exceptions. One, in other than group one occupancies, an enclosure shall not be required for openings serving only one adjacent floor and that are not connected with corridors or stairway, stairways serving other floors. Two, unenclosed existing stairways need not be enclosed in a continuous vertical shaft if each story is separated from the other stories by one hour fire resistance rated construction or approved wired glass set in steel frames and all exit, and cor all exit corridors are sprinkled. Sprinkler. The openings between the corridor and the occupant space shall not shall have not fewer than one sprinkler head above the openings on the tenant side. The sprinkler system shall be permitted to be supplied from the domestic water supply system, provided that the system is of adequate pressure, capacity, and sizing for the combined domestic and sprinkler requirements. Three, existing penetrations of stairway enclosures shall be accepted if they are protected in accordance with the building code of New York State. 
Petitioner seeks request relief from 1011.7.2 exception to unenclosed stair requiring one hour rating. You may present. Great, and please you. identify yourself and then sure. present. Uh, Stephanie Clark with Elevate Architecture. It's at 15 Cobblestone Court in Orchard Park. And this is my colleague. Nathan St. John, also of Elevate Architecture. So we had put together. Sorry, a Stephanie, can you spell your name for the record, please? Sure, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-C-L-A-R-K. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, it's Ricky Andrews. Um, the, the, do you understand what the chairman said about the three votes that you need? Yes. That um, it, it has to be unanimous. It can't be two to one. Yes. It's still a failure. Okay. Yeah. So in our package, we have submitted a few exhibits for your review. Uh, exhibit one was the summary, which I think as uh, Mr. Flynn had read through, that pretty much summarizes what we're here today asking for. We have two variances. Um, the building itself, just to kind of give you a, a broad overview, is uh, 1940. It's located in the city of Buffalo, the Fillmore District at the corner of Broadway and Fillmore. It was constructed in 1940, um, and it was originally used for the Ecker department store. So that historically is, was the use for it. Uh, over the years, it has changed a bit. There was uh, offices most recently in it. It's been vacant for probably a good 15, 20 years. Um, we are here on behalf of our client, Cedarland Development. They've recently uh, gotten a plan in place working with ourselves to do the first floor is a daycare, so that's our use. The basement would be an urban farm, and that is the F use that we are proposing, as well as two floors of residential on the second and third floors. So that's 28 residential units total. This will be affordable housing, um, and they are going through the historic tax credit process as well. So one of our variances is directly related to that historic tax process. Um, exhibit four that we have presented is a letter from SHPO that is requiring us to leave the staircase in question open on just the first floor as it was historically to get our tax credits. Um, so that's kind of the history behind that one. We are proposing to put additional sprinkler heads in. The building is fully sprinklered currently, so we are going to main be maintaining that as well as uh, upgrading the system to make sure that each of the residential units that we are now enclosing on the second and third floors are um, appropriately covered. Um, exhibit three, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. Um, exhibit three shows uh, existing photos and our code review plan showing all the other existing um, rated enclosures of the stairwells. We do have three additional stairwells on each of the floors from the top floor down that are appropriately enclosed in the two hour construction and will be maintained for the duration of the project um, and the history and the future of it. So really it's just this one central grand stair that we're asking for the variance on. Um, the other variance that we're re requesting is for just the second and third floors where we're putting residential units. So these were never historically broken up into spaces. So we are actually um, opening up some daylight into these units. So if you're looking at the best one to look at is probably exhibit two. It would be pages <laughs> A102 and A103. We've highlighted on those the areas that we're asking for these considerations that we are directly on the property line. So some of the windows in question are existing to remain, but we are replacing the window itself. Um, so those we're just proposing to put an additional sprinkler head on the inside of the building within the residential unit. The others are, were never historically windows, so we are opening up some new openings in the masonry, and those we're additionally asking for, uh, or proposing sprinkler heads in lieu of rated enclosures on that property line. So those are the two uh, variances and then the exhibits that we have prepared and presented along with them. Yeah, question. Sure. Um, so the 
As far as the openings in the exterior walls, we've given similar variances, so I don't really have a problem with that. You do propose a sprinkler head above each window, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, in addition to the regular sprinklers in yes. the building, in the room itself. Okay. Um, what prevents the the next door property owner from building directly on their property line? Is it the building code or yeah. would it be uh, an easement of some type? Uh, it, there is nothing in place currently that I'm aware of. Uh, there is an existing building there currently, so it's not a vacant site. Um, and it's a, a church that has been there for years. So okay. so that if something was built on the property line, it would be uh, obviously that would defeat the purpose of what you're doing there, right? Correct, yeah. Um, as far as the stairwell goes, the um, you just mentioned in your brief that you said that the, the only floor that will not be enclosed one hour is the first floor. So the only there are existing wired glass partitions on the basement and the second floor that were historically there. So we are leaving those in place. So from a fire rated one hour standpoint, those are not enclosed, but those are smoke. We will have those being Enclosed right. from a smoke standpoint, right. the third floor does have a concrete with rated doors at the top of it. So it's really the, only the first floor that's completely open to the floor adjacent to it. You okay, can... so then for the first floor, what is preventing you from enclosing it? And I'm using Shippo's letter where they actually tell you that you could use movable, retractable, or more glazing. They mentioned in their letter what stops you from closing that uh, and obviously you know where my where i'm coming from here the smoke yeah the smoke conditions yeah. so we, we're turning into a residential building yes and with, which is in our, my case i think is one of the higher hazards because people have to get out right it's low-income housing or, or affordable housing which 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 um could have and they will have to have handicaps um you know spaces handicap apartments right so it might be difficult for those people to get out so that's really my concern. Um, so, so the second and the third floors are the residential. Right. So in those two floors, we would maintain an hour safe egress to right. all three of those stairways as well as the elevator that's up there. Mm -hmm. So the first floor is the daycare. So from a, from a safety standpoint, no one will be taking the staircase that we're discussing. Should have mentioned that in the brief. We're going to be securing it on the second, third, and basement floors, so you can't actually circulate on the staircase. Oh, so yeah. those those will be all enclosed. You Completely won't be able secure. to actually. I thought I read that, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, I apologize for admitting that earlier. So it'll that be. Won't... So it's basically uh, looks only. It's, yeah, there's no essentially. Purpose yeah. Of it. So from a so from a safety standpoint, on the daycare uh, side, so the first floor, we're proposing just very low um, gates so that the children can't go down the staircase, but we're leaving it open and Shippo was amenable to the look of that. We did originally propose a glass enclosure like you had mentioned, but Shippo said that that was too, it just, it, you couldn't see this, the full grandeur of the staircase. And that's where this letter came back and said, you know, think about something from a retractable standpoint, from a safety for the children standpoint, but from a egress standpoint, this staircase isn't needed for egress from the either any of the floors. And we're not planning on using it as that. So if the doors will be locked. There will be signage on it that says this is not an exit, so that no one's confused from the second and third floors that they would be able to use that for an egress. Will there, there be any, there be no doors that access it. There's doors there, but we will leave them in place so from what, a historic standpoint. What prevents that from you know down the road from being accessed? You know, I think from the occupant standpoint, the daycare doesn't want anyone to. Be able oh, to obviously, that. right, right. But so, I mean, it's still a it's still a nightmare for the code official to have to enforce that because obviously they would go in, you know, three years down the road, say, hey, you know, this stairwell's right here. What the heck? Why aren't we using it? You know? Yeah, I so mean, if, if if there's something that we could do to permanently fix it, right? To to permanently to make you feel comfortable from a permanent standpoint that that maybe it's they look like doors, but they're not actually doors anymore. So we could modify the. Storefront closures. So well, it's even it's confusing in a, in a in a in a situation, in an emergency situation. It's confusing. Yeah. You know, you come out of your apartment. There's a door there. I can't get out of it. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's that bothers me. Okay. okay. And I see. So in other words, the, the basement's enclosed, so that the smoke wouldn't really get out of the basement. Right. 
to get to the first floor. Right. Yeah. Um, is, there, is there a reason you couldn't uh, sort of seal off the staircase at the ceiling of the first floor or just above it? Um, yeah. I mean, since we're not planning on using it as egress, yeah. that makes yeah. you feel yeah. more yeah. You're, you're eliminating that shaft way as you was a road up there. Yeah. It would just have to be from a visual standpoint, right. I think, from yeah. for ship all that you yeah, wouldn't be able to. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, could for the transcript because everyone's not letting each person finish their sentence. I'm having a hard time hearing um what you're saying because some person saying yeah interjecting. Could we just try to keep it one at a time, please? I'm sorry. I think. Uh, from a ship standpoint, we would just need to make sure from the 1st floor, you couldn't actually see the. So, we would have to just work with them in order to make sure whatever permanent enclosure we have there would, would work with them. And you mentioned um, in some at some point that you were willing to put some type of a deluge system. Yes. So, similar to the what they used to use for the escalators. Yes. yes. So, it's like, so would you drop that soffit down and make it a. Uh, we weren't planning on dropping a soffit on the first floor. Okay. But it would just be, we were planning on just having the sprinkler heads be exposed. Like a draft, it was like a smoke yeah. draft, you know, so draft curtains, so similar to, you know, it would come up and it would circulate, the smoke would circulate in that area and heat and maybe set those sprinkler heads off. Similar to that. Yes. There's something that you could, we, and then maybe at that point you could do something with the ceiling. Right. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. If we've got a ceiling in there anyway, that's collecting it and that can be the trigger of the damage. Yeah, so either yeah. or, yeah. Yeah. Either or, I would be comfortable with either or. Okay. Yeah. That's all I got. Do have any questions? Okay. The, um, in terms of the sprinkler system, is this just being just supplied by the municipal system or is there a fire pump or? Uh, it's just by the municipal system since it's historically a system we're working with the, it's right now it's in the, in the bid phase, so we're not starting construction, but the, we have a fire protection contractor on board, so they're doing all the necessary testing to make sure we've got the pressures like that. Yeah, it may, may need a jack and pump or something yeah, at that point. Yeah, so that's kind of being worked. It just it's been vacant for so long, it's just a little unknown right now. Sure. Yeah. David, as far as um, the legal end of it, would, is, would an easement be something that would would be triggered with this? I mean, there, there could be an easement. Um, uh, if, if someone were to redevelop this adjacent church property, uh, I would think they'd be subject um, to the city, you know, to the city setback requirements and code and zoning requirements, which I, mean, I would guess, I don't know for sure at this day in this day and age, probably would not permit a building up to the, the property line. If there was one already there, right. right. Um, that that might be a different uh, a different answer, but if someone elected to tear the church down and put some new structure on, I believe they would be subject to the uh, to right. zoning requirements. Is there anyone from the city? Maybe we could. Yeah, I was going to open that up to the uh, uh, to the uh, city. Peter Kleinman here from the city. I'm with the board member, but I would be speaking in the capacity as someone representing the city of Buffalo and not as a board member. Um, in the city, uh, buildings can be built on the property line, but they have to be of two hour construction. So at the point that uh, Stephanie's building were to be, uh, uh, the windows would, were to be covered, she or a designer of the owner's choosing would have to uh, figure out how to uh, turn those windows into uh, one hour or two hour construction and provide artificial light ventilation for that, for those areas. I'm sorry, sir. can you state your name for the record? I don't know who uh, you are. Peter Clayman, in, in the capacity of, of building inspector from the city of Buffalo and not in the capacity of a board member. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Is there anyone else here today that would like to speak on this matter? Please come up and identify yourself. Hello, I'm, thank you. I'm Cody Osborne, uh, building code specialist with the city of Buffalo. Um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you repeat that? Cody Osborne with the city of Buffalo, uh, 65 Niagara Square. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm here as the code specialist on this project and also representing Chief Mark Morgani. He's not here today, but we do have some members of his team if they need to speak at all. Um, we've been dealing with this project for a little bit now, working with the working with the team from Elevate as to how we can solve this. So we felt that the deluge for the staircase. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me, but I can't hear you guys. I'm sorry. Can you guys? I can't hear you guys. A, from their proposal, it looked like they were sprinkling them, but th this is going to be a sprinkler building anyway. Now I do understand from earlier they are going to deluge those windows as well. Um, I know Chief Morgani would also like to see those be rated windows as well. That's all I have. Thank you. Let's, before you leave, yep. um, Rick Andrews speaking. Um, would you be in favor of them completely blocking those doors off so they aren't doors, so that it looks like a, you're looking out into an atrium, let's say, so that it doesn't give you any confusion at all that, that those doors are there for any reason whatsoever. And if they're locked, I mean, I would, I would hate to have, or they're permanently fixed, I would hate to have someone get the false sense of security that that's there for, for exiting. Yeah, I would say because, like I was just mentioning previously with the signage, we want to make sure that these are noted, like yeah. you're saying, somebody comes out in an emergency, we want them to know blatantly that these are not doors. So if they were going to turn them into looking like a flat wall where there is no door or something, then yeah, of course. I feel more comfortable yeah. with that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Lieutenant <laughs> Marvin Spates. Buffalo Fires, uh, out of City Tall, 65 Court Street. Uh, talking Could you to spell your name for the record, please? Yes. Uh, S is in Sam, P is in Paul, A is in Apple, T is in Tom, E is in Echo, S is in Sam. First name, Martin. Thank you. Great. Uh, talking to uh, Chief Morgani uh, yesterday, uh, one of the things that uh, he wanted to stress upon was that the close proximity of the lot line uh, was one of his concerns and that if they were willing to go with a uh, three hour rated window with metal frame, then he would actually have no problem with that. And I know that's uh, one of those things that they were probably trying to not go against because of cost, but he said uh, life safety trumps everything. So thank you. You're welcome. So the correction was two uh, two hour. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I I've got a question for you. Those, those windows are extremely expensive. We've used them on some of our projects. Um, if that was a condition for us approving this variance, you're good with that, or? Uh, that's one of the reasons that we asked for the variance. It's just a very costly measure. Um, we'd have to discuss it with Cedarland Development to see if they're willing to. Just, I can't answer that question because I'm not an owner on the project. So I, I would discuss it with them and make, make sure they're comfortable with it. But that is one of the reasons that the, the variance was brought up. How many okay. windows are we talking on that wall? So we've gone to the point of the, the cost question. There are nine windows on the existing face that have windows that would be replaced. So that those are kind of existing to remain openings. Then there are 12 windows between the second and third floor on the second facade. Um, the nine windows that are existing to remain, we have had conversations with Cedarland if to just re remove some of them so that we would go from nine to three openings in that. Also from a cost measure, um, it is on the back of the building. So we felt that SHPO would be amenable to that just because they're not really seen from a, a right of way. So that would be reducing six of those windows in question. The 12 that are on the kind of north side of the west face of the building, those we require just because those are residential units that we're putting in and those don't have any historic windows 
in there. So that would, we really can't, we could reduce the size of them potentially, but I think we still need to maintain the quantity of them from a natural light standpoint. What's the overall budget for this project? Uh, I believe we're coming in around 10 million right now. Sorry, what's your name, sir? Not you, the other gentleman. Shani. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ricky Andrews. Um, so, what you're proposing is a sprinkler head on the inside of the window, similar to the what they do with an atrium. Yes. It would have to be one foot from the window. Right. It would have to be down by the window. It would probably have to have a heat collector. I mean, those are all things that you're going to have to take into consideration with either SHPO or, or uh, you know, the residents themselves. I mean, you're going to have this head right. sitting. Yep. I don't know how you designed it other than put a heat collector on it because it has to be right above the window. It can't be at the ceiling. Yeah, and we're actually not putting ceilings in here, so it's a it reinforced concrete structure. Sure. We're leaving everything open in a residential unit, so it does have a nice high ceiling, and we can put those sprinkler heads. But in what I'm explaining is so. is not aesthetically pleasing. I mean, it's, yeah. it's it, and and you know we've had them where people, especially sidewall heads, where they hang their hangers on the side of it, and so you're yeah. causing something that could be tampered with or fooled with, or I mean it's. It's something that I don't even know if Shippo would go along with it, you know. Well, I guess I guess from the like your first comment of it not being aesthetically pleasing, that's why I brought up there's no there's no ceiling. So you'll see mechanical systems, you'll see the ductwork, you'll see the lights, the conduit, all that. So that will just be another piece that's up in the ceiling. I mean, so, it may I mean sometimes they'll they'll drop in a soffit, you know, they'll bring a soffit down and drop it in and bring it out, but it has to be one foot from the window so that it washes the window. So, so basically, you know, I mean, and, and the, uh, about going along with what the, the fire official there said that the, uh, in an atrium, they have to be glass. It's enclosed in, in uh, gasketed material. And right. it's a little bit of a different kind of a window. Yeah. I think the other, um, cost is a factor, but also finding a window that's 2 hour rated. That will meet chipo standards was the other well that's what i read in the brief there was something yeah something yeah for so that. it was those two factors that you know led us to see if we can you know come before you today and just right. see what is acceptable it would be also a uh, fast acting head too it would be a residential fast acting head so it would go off a little bit quicker than the normal heads would go off yeah and i i looking through our exhibit it was the two with the floor plans. We did show the locations where we were proposed for the daily sprinklers in the staircase, mm -hmm. but did not put them in the right. actual residential. So that would just be an update to an exhibit that we would offer. Yeah, that would have to definitely be the, the case. It'd have, to, yeah. it'd have to be within one foot and definitely right down above the top of the window. So that washes the window and it would have to go off quicker than the normal heads, which are at the top of the ceiling. Yeah. So, I think anyone else have anything? You folks have anything else you want to say? Okay, uh, we're going to ask everyone to uh, leave the room. We'll deliberate and call you back in shortly. Um, can I just before we do, the record. I just want to clarify. Um, can I just clarify um, while we're off the record um, the exhibit on the record? This is uh, petition number 2023-0009, Petitioner Cedar Land Development Group. Uh, the petition requests a variance regarding alterations and change of occupancy to an existing building. This application is for building type 2B of group R2F1 slash I4 or 14 occupancy. The building consists of three stories and has a gross area of approximately 49,607 square feet. The building is located at 950 Broadway, City of Buffalo, County of Erie, State of New York. Petition seeks relief from uh, 19 NYCRR 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York, uh, F705.8 openings, openings in exterior walls shall comply with sections 705.8.1 through 705.8.6 and 
0.1 allowable area of openings, the maximum area of unprotected and protected openings permitted in an exterior wall uh, in any story of a building shall not exceed the percentages specified in table 705.8 based on the fire separation distance of each individual story. Uh, petitioner requests relief from the allowable provisions of table 705.8. And 19 NYCRR 1227, the 2020 existing building code of New York State, F 1011.7.2 stairways, where a change of occupancy classification is made to a higher hazard category, as shown in table 1011.4, interior stairways shall be enclosed as required by the building code of New York State. Project at 950 Broadway entails the historic restoration, historic restoration, renovation, and reuse of the three-story former Eckhart Department Store located at 950 Broadway. Uh, project will utilize the long neglected and abandoned historical building encompassing a total project area of 0.82 acres. It will be subject to building renovations on the first, second, and third floors. Uh, findings of fact. The project at 950 Broadway entails the historic restoration, renovation, and reuse of the three story former Eckert Department Store located at 950 Broadway. The project will utilize the long neglected and abandoned historical building, encompassing a total project area of 0.82 acres. Two, there is an existing historical central staircase that is open on the first floor and enclosed by doors on the basement, second, and third floors. The stair must remain uh, open per, or must remain per SHPO and cannot have the required smoke rated fire enclosure as that would impede visual access and would be detrimental to the historic nature of the building. Access to the central stair will be prohibited. The doors will be removed on the second and third floors and no signage uh, will be near uh, those areas to imply egress. And the staircase itself will be closed at the top of the first floor. Three, the building will be fully sprinklered with deluge sprinklers, providing additional protection of the existing central stair on the basement, first, second, and third floors. Separate fully enclosed stair towers located at the southwest, northwest, and northeast corners of the building will handle the required building egress. Four, the existing aluminum storefront enclosing the basement and second floors are not rated construction. Uh, they're seeking relief from 1011.7.2, where exception two stipulates that an existing unenclosed stair requires one hour uh, rated separation from story. <clears throat> Five, the building is zero setback along the western property lines. There are several existing windows along the western property lines above an existing building at 940 Broadway. In addition, there are several proposed new openings near to the existing openings that are required to provide natural light to the new apartment units along the west property line. Six, the design intention is to replace the existing windows in kind and cut new penetrations where shown. However, the rated windows required are prohibitively expensive and very difficult to source in a design that would meet SHPO standards and match other non-rated replacement windows. Seven, each window along the property line, replacement and new, would be sprinklered with quick response residential, residential sprinklers directly over the window and inside to mitigate the fire hazards. Um, in accordance with the above findings, strict compliance with the provisions of the Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code would be uh, would entail practical difficulties or unnecessary hardship and would be unnecessary in light of alternatives, 
which achieved the intended objective of the code more efficiently, effectively, or economically, and granting the variance would not substantially adversely affect the code's provisions for health, safety, and security. I'll take a motion to approve. I so move, Rick, Rick Andrews. I second, John Shenney. All in favor, Mr. Andrews? Yes. Mr. Shenney? Yes. I'm David Flynn and I vote yes. The uh, variance is granted as stated. Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, just a note to the fire department that I would suggest that you pre-plan this and, and then make notes that the uh, the stairwell is not accessible for the fire department either. I mean, obviously you can break through the glass to get into the different units, but it's not going to be a usable stairwell for firefighting. So, thank you. Uh, this decision is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted or give implied approval of any general plans or specifications presented in support of this application. The hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. I'll note on the record that Mr. Kleeman is going to be rejoining us for the remainder of the uh, petitions today. Okay, our second hearing today in the matter of petition number 2023-0033. The petitioner is Mark Hanby. The petition requests a variance regarding alterations to an existing building. This application is for a type, a building type 5B of one or two family dwelling. The building consists of one story. The building is located at 5629 West Lake Road, County of Groveland, County of Livingston, State of New York. The petition seeks relief from 19 NYCRR 1220, the 2020 Residential Code of New York State, AJ601.5, flood hazard areas, in flood hazard areas, alterations that constitute substantial improvement shall require that the building comply with section R322 of this code. And 19 NYCRR 1220, the 2020 Residential Code of New York, R322.1 general. Buildings and structures constructed in whole or in part in flood hazard areas, including A or B zones, and coastal A zones as established in table R30121 and substantial improvement and repair of substantial damage of buildings and structures in flood hazard areas shall be designed and constructed in accordance with provisions contained in this section. Buildings and structures that are located in more than one flood hazard area shall comply with the provisions associated with the most restrictive flood hazard area. Buildings and structures located in whole or in part in identified floodways shall be designed and constructed in accordance with ASPE 24. Petitioner seeks relief from the basement not having the mechanicals within flood zone area. You present your petition, please. And, and so, I'm Gina Pistel, our architect um, from Design and Drafting Incorporated from Batavia, my wife, Debbie. Um, I think I'll just read read this if I could. I think you've been submitted this as well. Do I have a bunch of read that? Your letter. <laughs> Do I need to read it? No, I don't think so. No, we need to look. Um, I think the main, main thing is that we um, purchased the house. Well, as soon as we purchased it, we found um, mold in it. We had to do some renovations, put $93,000 of renovations. Um, after that, um, what officer said that we had put more than 50% of the um, market value of that praise value of the house, and therefore we lost our exemptions. Then we had to start doing all kinds of new things, raising the basement floor, et cetera. And um, we had a a professional um, appraisal of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, which was nowhere near the you know, fifty percent mark, and so we lost all of our, our clauses, grandfather clauses, and now we're under all of these new rules and obligations, which has been financially draining and um, and 
as a result, the cold officer has um, made our houses, the main house that we live in, we haven't lived in in over a year, and a cottage that's up on a high bank as uninhabitable. We haven't been able to live in our house for over a year now. And um, we have a, the lowest part of our seawall is 42 inches high. The rest of it goes up to seven feet high. And um, even, in, even in a hundred year floodplain, there's no way for water to get in there. Um, so we've done everything that we think possible at this point. If we did have to raise the basement floor that was required, it would then bring it about six inches to the existing furnace, which would make, if we ever had a flood from rainwater, that would make that a dangerous situation. And you wouldn't be able to actually navigate down in the basement. Um, the house was built, you know, 100 years ago, probably. <clears throat> um, so uh, I guess we're, we're asking um, to begin with that we are no longer under that um, obligation of, um, you know, new construction. Um, and, you know, so there's several other things, but I think that's the main thing that we're addressing right now. Um, I'm open to questions if you have them. I just want to clarify one thing right off the bat. Um, Rick Andrews, uh, and, and I'd like the attorney to address these because uh, you mentioned in your summary, you, you mentioned three three items. Mm -hmm. um, number one, the do not occupy. I don't feel that's in our jurisdiction. Now that's, that's basically a decision by the code official. Uh, the second one is that you don't want to remove, remove the cabinets and et cetera, et cetera. That has to do with the zoning. That, that sounds like it's a zoning problem, whether that's a unit or not a unit or whether it's livable or not habitable, or that's a zoning issue. Um, so really the third thing is really all that we're here for um, is just that one variance for the flood plaintiff. So uh, I, if I'm correct on that. Yeah, so the, this board only sits in review and can grant variances to these various codes. So if you've got issues with the zoning or uh, other codes that aren't building codes, we have no jurisdiction in that space. So you'd have to talk to the municipality. So the so the <clears throat> the appraised value that's not an issue. Well, the, the that'll come under the issue of the floodplain. But you know, okay. and, and and obviously I looked at the engineer and the building officials. So they probably have the most knowledge on floodplains. Okay. But so, so we're really just looking for the request. Relief from the basement, not having the mechanicals within the flood zone. Really, that's where, where we're, what we're the issue is at this point. David Flint. Um, so, just that I, I understand, you you spent approximately ninety three thousand dollars in renovations on the building. Taking them all down. Yeah. Uh, you had an appra a professional appraisal done of the, the house, the and, house. Not, and, and not the outbuildings and all of that. Just the correct, house. Correct. So that and and. You're representing that the house raised value is 750. So the 93 is well short of 50%. Um, what, what is the municipality saying is the value of the home? Um, they went by an old assessed value of 135,000. And obviously 93 is more than 50% of that. But then with the mold remediation, would that be? Cost of renovation. I mean, that's remediation. Is, I mean, that's it's it's an, an interesting question. Exactly. Uh, I mean, that wouldn't even wouldn't think that would come into play for actual renovation of the, of the house. We didn't think so either. But I'm just saying. I that's just I'm just trying to get that out on the. You know, the other question I had too is if you could go over this site plan for us, or mm -hmm. you know, I I don't see where the where this cottage is, and I'm not gonna. I, this other house, is someone else's house, is that correct? On the on the plan. Um, to the north of where your house is, to the north. another house. Is that someone else's house? Um, to the north west would be where the small cottage is that's up on the hill. Is it on this site plan? Yeah, let's let me just pull this up. I just wanted to clarify this because it didn't make sense to me. And can I get the name of the, the council? In the center, please? you have that little round, round disc there. That's the main house that that has the basement that's that's in question. And then up on top right, it says storage building. Let's see. 
above the word lot 16. Okay. Oh, that's that storage building is the cottage. Well, that used to be a storage building a long time ago, but it's now it's, now it's a cottage. Okay. Because yeah. you're you're referencing in your letter A and B, and mm -hmm. looking around, I'm not seeing all that. So yeah, if you can explain. So the house that's there on lot 16 is that your house? Yes. And then this over here is a new house. The one to to the left. Yes. Yes, it's a new construction. It's one we're building right now. That has nothing to do with this. No. Okay. This is the one we're talking about. Yeah, mm -hmm. that middle one. <coughs> and that has that seawall in front of it. Okay. All right. That's just clear. And, and the variance that you're requesting pertains to just the existing house itself, none of the other construction. The um, none of none of the new construction, but the the cottage, the one's up on the top right, that also has an uninhabitable sign on it as well. But that's that's the zoning issue. Right. That's nothing to do with yeah. that, the, 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 what yeah. we're here for. Got it. Okay. So I defer to our experts on the floodplains because, like I said, that's not my expertise. So. And, and I do, if you need to, we do have um, Chuck Smith from Architectural Designs from Fairport. He's sick today, but he's available on the phone, and this is his expertise as well, if you need to hear his side of it. Have you looked into a letter of map plan revision? With who? A letter of map plan revision from uh, Thank you. the Tamer Rags to pull the house out of the floodplain. Um, I've been working with FEMA on that. Okay, that they call it a Lomar, mm -hmm. and typically um, you stated before that it's very unlikely that this site would have flooded, 100 year flood. Correct. Okay, typically when something's borderline, you can approach FEMA and get the property taken off of floodplain map. Mm -hmm. And the process for that is called a letter of map plan revision. Have you pursued that? We, we, we talked with them, but the architect that would like to speak, he said that the what's our our house has a deck on it, and that deck is attached to the house. That deck sits on the seawall. And so the seawall, the measurements are all the way down to the bottom where the water is. And that's how they're measuring it. And said, so unless we change the deck and remove the deck from off of the house, the measurements are going to still be down where the floodplain is, and they can't they can't alter that unless we remove the deck from the house. That's what they're telling us. So when the when the um, yeah. guy who does the um, drawings, what's he called? The architect. Yeah, no, not the architect. The, oh, the land surveyor. The surveyor. He said he said that's the issue right now. He said your your posts from the deck attached to the house are sitting on the seawall. He said and that's part. That seawall is now part of the structure. Okay. How does the seawall relate to the elevation of the floor of the basement? Because they're saying that their lowest point is the bottom of that seawall, not the basement itself. Because the because the posts that the deck is sitting on that's attached to the house are sitting on the seawall. Therefore, it's the bottom of the seawall that has to be measured, which is lower than the basement. That's what FEMA's told telling us. I've been doing this for 40 years, and typically they use the lowest elevation that the basement floor. That's what that's what Chuck Smith says. If I could, if I could let him speak, he he more articulate than I am, and he could explain it. And I think you two would understand each other. Okay, if I can get him on. He's not on the phone. You're getting him on the phone. Yeah. yeah. I think everyone can hear him. Good morning, Chuck. Um, so this will be Chuck Smith from um, Design Works in Fairport, New York. Um, I'm Mark Hamby. Uh, Chuck, we're at the board meeting right now, and there's a gentleman here that knows exactly what you know about the floodplain and the, the problems that we're facing right now with um, measuring that. Can you explain your, your take on that, please? Well, yeah, we've got a flood certificate that um, indicates that the, the house is connected to the, it was within the floodplain because of a deck that's connected to the house, which is supported by a the seawall. Um, so the surveyor that completed this flood certificate, uh, Gary Dutton, 
explain that he, he had checked with FEMA on the interpretation of that and because um, because the, the seawall is part of the structure of the deck in other words deck is supported by the seawall uh, it connects to the lake and the floodplain of the lake and thus connects the house to the floodplain so it, it's a not a very um, common sense situation um, but that's how uh, FEMA uh, has has uh, determined that we, we are within the floodplain uh, even though the house itself is outside of the floodplain uh, so I don't know if that's the answer or what the question was but. yeah that, that's exactly what the question was um, I'm John Shenny I'm the engineer member of the board here uh, we've done a lot of floodplain work, and, and typically, um, when you've got a situation like this, you can approach FEMA and ask for a letter of map plan revision and have the property taken out of the floodplain. Um, it seems that that would be simple to do since your basement floor elevation is well above what the 100-year floodplain is, and it shouldn't matter that the uh, Retaining wall foundation is below the 100 year flood elevation. Uh, typically, FEMA makes decisions based on floor elevations, not, not foundation inverts. Yeah, that would make sense. Uh, Peter Clayman here asking you a question. Um, is it uh, prohibitively uh, expensive to support the deck structurally uh, by, the, by the ground behind the retaining wall instead of by the retaining wall? Yes, it would, it would pretty much have to be completely removed and rebuilt. So I'm not knowing the topology from a survey. I have no idea uh, well, you know, what kind of effort that would be. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I, I would say I would say it could be done, of course. Uh, I just did not prepare to, uh, to know what the cost of that would be. This is David Flynn. Um, the, what, uh, looking at it at the other way, it seems like it, it's the connection between the deck and the house that brings the wall in. If the deck were adjacent to the house but not connected to it and supported on the house side of the deck, independently of the, the house itself, I'm wondering if that would allow then the house to be looked at and the, uh, and the basement of the house rather than tying in the deck, the, the seawall structure. I, I, have no, I have no idea what what that would entail, but supporting the land, I'm sorry, the house side of the deck independently of the house itself. Uh, yeah, we thought of that. That could be done. The, the uh, Gary Dutton, the surveyor, suggested that as a potential solution because then we could disconnect the deck and the house with the elevations of the issue uh, a location certificate. Um, again, I don't know the cost of that solution. So Rick Andrews, I have a question also for you. Um, so if you would go with the um, floodplain, removal of the floodplain, um, what would be the cost of, you've, you've asked for an economical hardship. You said there would be a cost for the new floor. What is the cost? We have no figures of what the cost would be for new floor. Um, for the entire project, we are on $22,000. For the floor? And bringing the stone in. We're, we're down below. The, there's no way to get concrete and trucks in there. Right. So $22,000 to mm -hmm. put the new floor? Minimum. And what is the present height of the crawl space? Uh, sure, five foot, five foot truck. No, the elevation certificate states that it's being 21.1. No, what, what is the present height of the crawl space? The, the crawl space in the basement right now. That's what it is, being 21.1. Well, I know, I mean, like you're talking about standing. Yeah, standing, yes, yeah. If I were to stand up in there. Oh. I understand the question. The bottom of the floor joists are approximately 827 and the uh, the. Crawl space is a dirt floor with 
wooden pallets and the, the, the surveyor measured to the top of the wood pallets, which he considered a floor. That was a 21.4, which gives you approximately six feet of height in that crawl space. At most, I'm, I'm just barely. So the 18 would cut it down to four feet, probably. So six feet. I mean, it would. I'm Chuck, when I stand up in there, I, I can't stand up. I'm five foot six. Can I, can yeah. I not interrupt you? Yeah, sure. Gina's got the picture. Gina Pistillo. Um, when I showed up at the job site to take some pictures and you stand on that wall, you have to actually step down into the basement a couple steps to get to where the pallets are and then the six foot. So the wall clearly is higher than the finished floor of the basement. Sure. Um, there is some mechanicals lower. We did talk about putting uh, instead of the hot water tank, getting that up off the ground, but none of the components are at the base of that. Um, there is a sump pump in there, so if any rainwater, because the back side of this house has the hill on it, that's where all the mold came into play. Um, so the back side of this house up against the hill, there is a sump pump. So even by filling this up is going to be high lower, you know, it'll bring that lower than the height of um, bringing this garage floor up. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense with the drainage that's already in place um, for rainwater to actually bring that finished floor up um, to meet those requirements. And one last question for the gentleman on the telephone. Um, is if if we gave you a variance for the state, is there a is it a federal a federal wetlands that involved at all? Um, the reason I say that is that federal has regulations also, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, where you could get the variance from the state variance, but there may be federal regulations that we can't override. I understand that. Okay. Hey, Mark. Yes. Did you want to consider the pressure treated floor? Well, I guess the question would be, is the 50% you know, if I did put 50% more, then this is, this doesn't even it's a move question. It's a move question, right? That's what I really would love to see happen. Well, yeah, that's something we'd consider. I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I just want to point out to the board, um, just as a, an alternative to this quandary is, uh, I did, I did talk to, uh, Ellis, the regional rep about the allowability or the code, the code allowability of, of using a pressure treated floor to raise that uh, elevation of the crawl space as opposed to uh, bringing in crushed stone base and then pouring a concrete floor, which is uh, clearly much more difficult. And uh, Ellis and I discussed it, and he couldn't find anything that precluded using. Uh, Pressure treated floor as a as the full the full floor in the residential code. Uh, he did he did uh, talk to uh, did talk to the to the code official of the town, uh, Mr. Maxwell, and, and I guess I guess that conversation uh, was heard by Mr. Maxwell, but he he thought that. Uh, that would be only a decision that can be done by a state burdens for So that that's out there as well. If that conversation did occur with, with Ellis, um, we thought it might be a, a less expensive solution to uh, Mr. Maxwell's uh, determination that we need to raise the floor of the crawl space to comply with the uh, floodplain requirements of the residential code. Okay, thanks, Chuck. And Chuck's not here today because he's sick, but you have a question, Chuck? Oh, yeah, this is John Shenny. Um, the residential code in New York specifically allows wood foundations. So I don't believe any variance would be required if you wanted to raise that with pressure treated wood. But I, I've, I've got a, a different question here. Um, I believe this building is covered by the existing building code of New York. Um, what you're talking about, putting a new kitchen and everything here, doesn't rise to the level of uh, level three alterations. Um, 
Excuse me, John, I think it's two different issues. Yeah. I think the kitchen was the cottage, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh the, to taking the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To, 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 yeah the the owner owner wants us to remove the, the other. Okay. Yeah. But then the renovation he's speaking of. of the I'm kitchen. talking about the renovation. Yeah, this yeah we, put, we put new kitchen cabinets, new kitchen floors, we put everything in there new. Okay. I'm not sure that that rises to the level, a uh, level three alteration, which would take away the grandfather. Right. If it's a level one or a level two alteration, um, I believe the existing building code would allow this to remain as is. That's what we would hope. Uh, unfortunately, John, he's in the um, uh, uh, appendix J, given the use of that building, which is a one and two family house. He's not in the existing building code. So under the floodplain section. Uh, so we're we're in a position where uh, uh, can you readily uh, say that uh, uh, you've only done office level one uh, in the, within the context of the uh, appendix J of the build, existing building or appendix J of the residential building code? We did the renovations to remove the mold and put, you know ripped out everything that we could that was moldy. Yeah. Because I think I think I think that if if he's in within uh, the appendix J, alt level one, I don't know that I don't know how he's going to trip it. But of course, this, of course, the particulars of uh, of the petition are at our R two 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 or R three two two point one, which is which again is sort of a a, a totally different issue because it's a flood zone issue. Right. I guess the, the definite, I guess my question for Mr. Cheney and, and Pete uh, is the this code says substantial. Does it actually define 50 percent? Uh, the substantial. Um, it says sub substantial. The, the code actually says are the renovations that the renovations are substantial. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're um, is there a definition? In the I system? believe there is a definition in the uh, in the residential building code for the 50%. Okay, so that's how they got. Uh, we, I mean, we got the I hope we had the code official yeah. that we could hear from. So yeah. that's a good thing. I can clear up the line. Okay. okay. Did you guys have anything else you wanted to do? We just want to live in our home again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like the code official is Chuck, Thank you all. And let's check you on this. No, what else would be speaking at? We'll start with the code official. Do you want me to come up? Please. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chuck. Grab that chair. Please identify yourself. Ron Maxwell, the code enforcement officer for the town of Roblin. First, here's an elevation certificate from Gary Dutton saying the place is in the flood. And if you read on, it says top of bottom floor, including basement crawl space, they're at 821.1. That's basically base flood. And if you go back to 322, it says if you've got a basement or a crawl space below grade on all four sides, and you've got to go down and step down into it, that's where we start. That's from where I came up with the flood. And here's. And I did accept Mr. Hamby's appraisal because the appraisal was done a year and a half after he'd been to the grievance. I got contacted by the assessor at the time, and he said, how can somebody put 93,000 into a house without a building permit. I said, you probably can't, what is it? And then he went on to tell me that Mr. Hamby told him, and I did tell him, he asked me about replacement windows. And I said, if you aren't doing anything structural through the window, you're just taking the old window out, putting a replacement window in, I wouldn't require a building permit. I got an audio tape because the variance board met by Zoom, not the variance board, the board assessment review. Mr. Hamby, and you should have the transcripts if it came through, he said, for some reason, he moved the stove and found mold. He said he started in the kitchen, completely gutted it, 
went to the bathroom, then to the bedrooms, and then to the living room. He totally gutted and remodeled this house. They did new electrical work, never a law for electrical inspection, nothing. And I said, and I talked to a gentleman from the state, I don't know what his sure. name was, and he said the same thing you did. You can use a wood foundation in the coat. But if you go back and read chapter four, you can have a wood foundation, but you gotta have a cement floor. You do, there's nothing in chapter four in a wood foundation that allows a wood floor. And I did talk to a gentleman from the state because I said I wasn't comfortable with a pressure treated floor. And he said, well, I don't know if you can say that or not. And I said, why? And he said, well, FEMA says is ambiguous what you can use, but it says it's got to be able to be cleaned and it can't harbor mildew and mold. the floor itself? Yes. We, with the, once that floor is in, Rick Andrews, uh, once that floor is in. Then they could go to FEMA and get a loan. Would there be a problem though with the, with the electrical or mechanicals then? Would the, they be within? The electric panels upstairs. So it's out of the way. How about the, the other mechanicals? Would they be in violation? If they No, if space? they raise the floor, then they'd all be above, okay. they'd be, yeah. They would be okay. Yeah. But if you read that flood certificate, that's in the flood. But if you read what it says, the lowest level, there's no openings, no nothing. All there is a door and you step down into it. And if you read the code, there's <laughs> nothing in there that allows me in 322 to say, go ahead and do it. And the town doesn't want me to put the town in that liability. The 93,000. Did that include the, I, 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 when you're saying when gutting the house, obviously is totally different than just taking some drywall down for mold. Uh, but that 93,000, does that include the remediation of the mold? Yeah, everything. It include in his paperwork, he said that they did structural work for some of the rafters, and I guess they replaced some of the floor glazes. I didn't know any of this. The only reason I knew about it was because the assessor. So regardless of the cost, if they're doing something that you felt required a building permit, which you feel it did because they gutted it, um, it regardless of the, the cost, it didn't, and, really, it didn't really matter at the cost at that point. But if you read uh, Appendix J, substantial damage and substantial improvement, it's 50% of the structure before the start of work. Mr. Hamby did not bring an appraisal to the zoning board. He paid $399 for this property. So I went back to the assessor and said, what is the house worth? He said about $135. And this appraisal. Hello, can you hear me? Your mic is off. I can't hear you guys. Andy. I can't hear. I know. Send a um, message and see if they see Cost that. comparison. He said, by the time you put what it costs to the depreciation, the value of what the town had plus 93,000, you're only about 30,000 apart. That's out of my purview. Right. And can I speak frankly? And Grove is one of four towns around Kinesis Lake. We're having a terrible time getting people to follow the 50% rule. Matter of fact, I got a meeting tomorrow with Brianna Whitley, I think that's how, from Region 8 PEC to go over all the FEMA stuff. And one of the questions they got, 
Do you understand what substantial improvement is? And if you grant the variance, what the fallout is going to be, the word's going to get around. Everybody's going to say, just go ahead and do it, and then go apply for a variance. Well, each case is taken on its own merits. Yeah. So, you know that. so yeah. Do, you, do you feel that this uh, variance would be a substantial variance? Yeah. All you got to do is bring the floor up, and then he can do like you said. And I said the same thing. Do a loan one. Um, can I just address that? I do, Gina is still over again. I do wish we had pictures of the basement because if it is brought up to the level, you will not be able to access that basement at all. At all. You will have to have somebody crawl. It will not be, it'll be less than four feet, um, which turns it into a crawl space, which makes it almost impossible to get down there. Um, so where it's at now, even even to put some type of wood flooring um, or crusher run, vapor barrier and crusher run would by far be better than actually bringing that finished floor up. Because again, it, it's only six foot and it is stepped down from that seawall. So it, you're gonna call it create more of a hazard by having it a crawl space than keeping the, because uh, there's only six feet in there right now, headroom. And the furnace, the furnace is only about two and a half feet from the floor. And you can answer this uh, as far as uh, if we would, is this a, a federal regulations are met also besides the state regulations? You got to remember, we go by the flood plain map and FEMA regulates it. Right. So in their February 15th of 1991. So you can, I, what I'm trying to say is that if we grant a variance, it still may not meet the federal regulations. It still may be in, it still, still be in keep the them where they are. So they still need to spell the problem. We're talking about it. Great. According to the uh, affidavit here filed by the surveyor, the flood plan elevation is 821. And the bottom of that floor is 821.1. So they're a tenth above. You're only talking two inches. Right. But. Did he measure? They somebody said he measured off the pallets, so that really isn't the true floor. I just can go buy what I got. Okay. Who filled that certificate out? The gentleman okay. at fault. Um, Gary no, L. Dutton, sort of licensed land surveyor. Okay. Yeah, he's buying flood insurance on this property. Well, if he's within the floodplain, probably the bank or whatever demanded that he have it. But I think it's a simple matter to get this removed from the floodplain using that Lomar procedure. And then I believe most of this would go away without the floor being raised, without doing anything. No. Can I say something? Sure. Um, with due respect to Mr. Maxwell. Um, we did not change any of the walls in the bedrooms, two bedrooms. We did not change any of the walls in the living room. The only place that we took out drywall was in the kitchen where the mold was and where the windows were, where the water was coming in. That's the only place we changed the drywall and, and the insulation. Um, the only other place that we didn't change the structure. Um, that's what we were told. As long as you don't change the structure, you didn't need a building permit. And we went on that premise. Um, we did. Um, I do acknowledge there was one wire that was we found when we took the drop ceiling out. It was sitting there. They literally had this is an old house, so it's been there for a long time. They literally had buckets up above the ceiling, was taking water from two roofs that were that were coming through. And there was a there was an exposed wire there with with tape on it. So we we changed that. I I should have called him and asked him about that, and I didn't, and I acknowledge that. Um, but all of the other renovations were strictly taking all the mold out and and um, and changing changing the the floors and the and the kitchen. The kitchen cabinets had mold uh, saturated in the back of it, and that came to ninety three thousand dollars. Floors, kitchen. But that's also including the remediation. 
And so that's in, that's like entirely in remediation. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that, that's not the cost of the renovation. That was that was our total cost of everything. Yeah, but painting. Take the rate. How much was the remediation, the actual removal of mold? What did that cost you, the company, to come in and do that? Including like changing the the cabinets out. No, just oh. having them come in and remove the mold. Oh, probably around. And, and not putting the drywall back on. That has nothing to do with construction. Just them no. having that company come in and remove the mold. Um, I can only guess. I mean, there had to be a bill. There had to be a bill in there. Somewhere. Well, they they did more than just take the mold out. They did they did all of it. So there's a the construction company in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Amish did it. So they're not a they're not a mold remediation company. No, we we could only do what we could afford. Which is well understood, but that's not really the way you remove mold, but. That's between you two. My concern is they had an electrician in there. We got pictures of the house gutted. There was a whole new uh, built in place shower, a whole new kitchen put in. Electrician, and I understand, I'm not naive, things get done without the building inspector knowing. But if you're a competent electrician, wouldn't you, you have called for a fine or a rough electrical inspection before they covered anything up? Anything else? Okay, uh, is, is the, first of all, is there anyone else uh, that would like to speak on the matter today? Seeing and hearing none, uh, anything else from you folks? Um, I, I, I guess my, my hope would be that we could um, see that our, our house, if we were to sell our house today, just the house, uh, we wouldn't sell it for anything less than a half a million dollars. Um, it's, you know, I, I don't think that we put, we did not put more than 50% of the cost into it. And if that was to be the, the decision here, then all of this goes away. And, and if it doesn't, then we'd have to pursue other means that you recommend. Can I ask Mr. Maxwell for your official um, decision on, did you take his his evaluation and then realize that there wasn't a permit required, or are you just saying it doesn't matter what the cost was, he did enough? I No, what I did, and I got an audio of the Zoom meeting I'll do with you guys, I'm going by what he said at the Board of Assessment Review meeting. He put 93,000 in. He started in the kitchen and got it. Took so the you're ceiling down in the living room, and that's now a cathedral ceiling. So you're saying, regardless of the cost of renovation, you're saying that he needed building permits. Period. That had nothing. The to minute do. you run any wire. Understood. Understood. But that's what your that's yes. what your official statement is. Yes. Okay, that's what I need to know. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Um, if I may, Peter Kleinger, uh, uh, Rick, uh, a building official can only defer to his assessor's organization, and his assessor can deal with uh, outside. His his assessor can would be the person to deal with outside evaluations. Right. And so what I just wanted to clarify, Peter, is that uh, he's he's saying that. This this renovation or this substantial renovation had nothing to do with what his final decision was. His final decision was he did work and needed a permit, and he didn't obtain it. Yes. Didn't matter what the cost was. Didn't matter what the appraisal was. Can we back up one more? You asked about the houses being tagged unoccupiable. There was never any permits issued for these properties. Only a repair to the deck. Ever, and I had no CFO to pull, that's, yep. and that's why I did it. And you're absolutely right. This is how it was explained to me. This board does not do anything with zoning, no. and everything else he's complaining about is a zoning. All your issues. So. And what I was told that we didn't go into this blind. The town supervisor got a hold of Deb Babbitt Henry before she retired and told them what was coming down. She said, you write them back a letter and tell them if they got an issue, you go to the state. And, and she called me and said the town supervisor called her 
And I said, and she said, somebody from the state will be out to review your file. Do you have everything documented? And I said, yes. And then the next thing I know, I was blown away when you called, wanting to know what variants they were going to seek relief from. If I could just say one thing. Um, when I first met with Mr. Maxwell and bought the house, first of all, I built three houses and renovated six. And it's not my job. I just love doing it. Um, never had an issue with a building permit. Um, I, I, don't, I would never want to not have a building permit. I asked him, I said, Ron, do I need a building permit? And he said, not unless you're changing the structure. For window replacement. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, both but, of you, and, and it's really a moot point. If he makes a decision that you need a permit, then you need a permit. I agree, but I invited him down. I understood, but I mean, it, regardless of what the decision was, finally, that's his final decision. Okay. Not based on the 50% any longer. Now it's based on the work he did. And that's what, that's what he said in his official statement. That's what his official statement is. So. Okay, very good. I'm, I'm good. Okay. I'm good too. Thank you. Thank All right. You. We're going to okay. ask uh, everyone to uh, leave while we deliberate, and we'll call you back in shortly. We're going off the record. Twenty. Need to start over. Uh, yeah, might as well. They didn't record it. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, petition number 2023-0033, uh, Grief Party, Mark Handy, Residence, Brooklyn, New York, Nature of Grievance uh, and Relief sought the petition requests a variance regarding alterations to an existing building. This application is for a building type 5B of one or two family dwelling. The building consists of one story. The building is located at 5629 Westlake Road, Town of Brooklyn, County of Livingston, State of New York. The petition seeks relief from 19 NY, uh, NYCRR 1220, the 2020 Residential Code of New York State, AJ601.5 Flood Hazard Areas in flood hazard areas, alterations that constitute substantial improvement shall require that the building comply with section R322 of this code. 19 NYCRR 1220, the 2020 Residential Code of New York State, R322.1 General. Buildings and structures constructed in whole or in part in flood hazard areas, including A or B zones and coastal A zones, as established in Table R301.21, and substantial improvement and repair of substantial damage of buildings and structures in flooded hazard areas shall be designed and constructed in accordance with the provisions contained in this section. Buildings and structures that are located in more than one flood hazard area shall comply with the provisions associated with the most restrictive flood hazard area. Buildings and structures located in whole or in part in identified floodways shall be designed and constructed in accordance with ASCE 24. Petitioner requests relief from the basement not having the mechanicals within the flood zone. Findings. Um, the Board of Review uh, cannot assess the value of the property as it is not in our jurisdiction nor uh, in our powers to do so. Two, this board is bound by the code official's determination of a need for a building permit and that code official's determination for that need has not been appealed and we are not sitting as a, an appellate body uh, reviewing the code official's determination as to uh, the need for a building permit. Therefore, in accordance with the above findings, the board finds that insufficient evidence has been provided to warrant a variance under the grounds provided in 19 NYCRR 1205.4B, and the proposed alternatives do not ensure public safety and welfare. We further conclude that the uh, petitioners should consider applying for a letter of map plan revision to address the flood issue. 
Do I have a motion? Um, well, I motion Peter Klein. A second. I second it. John Shenny. John Shenny. Uh, Mr. Andrews. Yes. Mr. Shenny. Yes. Mr. Kleeman. Yes. David Flynn votes yes as well. This matter is concluded. Hey, David, I would say we do have a building permit now with the house, just for, for the record. Okay. This decision is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or specifications presented in support of the application. The hearing is concluded. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, John, when I contact FEMA, I'm asking for a map plane revision to do that through a surveyor. Generally, it's done through civil engineer. engineer so DEC Army Corps of Engineers? No. No. Consulting. Oh, just a civil engineer. Just a civil engineer. Okay. Thank you. I don't need just where you had my keys to. Yeah. Cool. They fill it up for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next hearing um, in the matter of petition number 2023-0034. Petitioner is Greater Southern Tier Bosey. This petition requests a variance regarding additions to an existing building. This application is for building of type 3B of Group E occupancy. The building consists of one story and has a gross area of approximately 19,245 square feet. The building is located at 1126 Bald Hill Road, Town of Hornell, County of Steuben, State of New York. The petition seeks relief from 19 NYCRR 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York State, 903.2.3. An automatic sprinkler system shall be provided for Group E occupancies as follows. One, throughout all Group E fire areas greater than 12,000 square feet, or 11, uh, 1,115 square meters in area, and two, the Group E fire area is located on a floor other than a level of exit discharge serving such occupancies. Exception, in buildings where every classroom has not fewer than one exterior exit door at ground level, an automatic sprinkler system is not required in any area below the lowest level of exit discharge serving that area. The Group E fire area has an occupant load of 300 or more. Petitioner requests relief from providing a sprinkler system. Please identify yourself and present your position. Yes, I'm Jeff Robbins, architect with Hunt Engineers and Architects, um, architect of record on the project. So, um, the site, as I think it, it states in there, is underserved by municipal water and um, the existing um, water supply cannot support a sprinkler system. And that's the essence for our request for the variance. Um, we have been in contact throughout the process with um, facilities planning at the state education department, and they are in agreement with um, I guess with the a variance um, request and they would support the variance on their side. I know they don't have to any longer, but, but they did let us know that. Um, and then the cost to, to try to make a sprinkler system work at this site would be prohibitive. Um, it would add roughly about a million dollars to the project. Uh, this project started planning about three years ago um, and the previous code rendition didn't require in this application under 12,000 square feet. It didn't have that stipulation of, of 300 occupants or more requiring the sprinkler system. Um, from a safety perspective, the, if you've looked at the plan, it's, um, it's a gymnasium is the full addition completely separated by the existing building with a firewall and the uh, exits provided um, have 50 percent more capacity than required by code um, the travel distance 
is depending on how we use the space is between 30 and 50% less than what's allowed by code to an exit. Um, so we believe with those uh, additional safety features that uh, the barrier should be granted. Uh, there is one other thing. It does have an automatic sprinkler, or not sprinkler, automatic fire alarm system, and we've included heads and, and uh, notifications in all spaces, whether required by code or not. So every space has a notification for the fire. To a locker room or something like yeah, that. Yeah, storage room, bathrooms, um, office. I had a question for you. Did I read in here that you don't have any fire hydrants on site that work? <laughs> yeah, it's a loaded question. There are fire hydrants on site. It, they, um, they're the uh, fire department's using it as a dry system, and they will only uh, activate it if there is an emergency because it, the system leaks. And they have it's a municipal system. They have immediate plans to correct that situation. So, um, yeah, they're, they're there, but they're not active without them turning on a valve. And then they, they can be active, but they don't have the pressure to support a sprinkler system. So you're in violation of fire code in New York. Yeah, I, I don't know how you could do that. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I no. can't see how the, I know, I know it's the state ed that's reviewing this. Right. It's not local authority, but a local authority having jurisdiction would not, there's no fire official that would allow that system. I mean, right. Just well, I mean, so the reality is you don't have a fire hydrant system. Which yeah. A lot of rural schools don't. Well, have. yeah, but it, but you don't, if, but if you have hydrants, if you have a municipal system, you have to have it. period. So they, they, the reality with what the system is there, they should remove the hydrants because they're not. Well, they can't, they can't remove them. I mean, you have, if you have municipal water, you have to have fire hydrants and you have to be within the distances. I don't know how to. Um, I mean, I force that issue on the on the on well, the town. Three years ago, you should have been negotiating with the with the uh, municipality and said, "We got to get this fixed. At least get a couple hydrants on location that we can use, because this this isn't. I mean." Like John says, I if you're in violation. As far as I'm concerned, you're in violation of fire code, and regardless of the sprinkler system, you know you're. You know it, it's it's not a rural area. I mean, you know, based on the fact that you have municipal water, if you didn't have municipal water, then it's a whole other issue that we have to address, and right. we have to come up with some other way, you know, to get water there. I mean, this is a school. You know, we're talking kids. You know. Yeah. And no, I don't. Understand. You know, I. Uh, you know, I can't. Speaking as a fire official, I cannot compromise on that. So, just to, so I understand, so you're saying because it's it served by municipal water, the municipality has to provide the fire hydrant, or or you have to provide it on but private property, you know. But it's not private property. The hydrants are on public property. They're not. They're not on our property. They follow the street that adjoins. Are they the within the distance, the proper distances for the fire code? Are within 150 feet? Yeah, the, the, the town street bisects the, the, the property where these buildings are. So they need to be within 150 feet of the entire area, you know, that they can get an effective hose stream 150 feet around the building. Like I said, state ed, I can't believe they passed, you know, they, they have said there's no problem. I don't, because there's nothing official here that says that, right? No, they're not required to fill out the form anymore. I mean, yeah. there used to be a form that they would and fill out. Still, yeah, I they um, still got to review it. And third, I mean, I just can't believe that. I, I guess the, the cool. It, it yeah. is, but there's there's this. I know it's it's served by municipal water for potable water, which is a different line than the hydrant system. But it's right on the fringe of like it, it is in a wooded area. I, you would consider a rural location, but the so municipal water supply. Yeah. Potable water is all municipal, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just on the basis of this alone, and I again speaking for myself, uh, I I would even unless that was addressed, I wouldn't even look at this. I I wouldn't personally even look at granting variance for this. Based on that. So I, again, I don't know how I address um, something that is out of my control. So I think um, as a body, we have an obligation to rule on the on the variance that's presented. 
Right. Okay. right. So um, now we we may have other things, you know, that we would include as part of a determination along along those lines. Um, but the the issue that's solely in front of us is right. whether the variance should be granted for you know as requested. Now, what what Mr. Andrews is saying is uh, is important in the sense that we're looking at this not in a vacuum, right? Right. It's what what is the fire protection generally, the health and safety protection generally for the school? And in the context of that, does the variance make sense for this particular application in this particular physical space? So we we we're not blind to the fact that there's no hydrants or our working hydrants uh, that are proper, apparently properly serving the school. Um, so I think you you have a couple of options. One is to proceed. With the, you know, with the variance, the other would be to pull it back. And have some, uh, you know, some thoughts and discussions with your client. I recognize this is not your decision, obviously. Um, such that there isn't the potential to have a, a denial of the variance. In, pending some further thoughts and discussions, I think you're getting a sense from this board. You know, and I'm not suggesting any other board is different than this, but you know, we we take this stuff seriously, and in the, in the broader context of the school and the fire protection, adding this structure and granting a variance on top of that, the sort of um, not well developed fire protection scheme may be problematic for, you know, for this board to grant the variance for this. So I'm suggesting, and, and it's it's completely your decision, we either proceed and uh, rule on the variance request, or you can pull this back, think about it, talk to your people, figure out what you can and can't do, and then, you know, bring it back before us. Um, and in which case you don't face the potential of having a the de a declination of the variance. Yes, I appreciate that. And yeah. just for your information, yeah. I you know in Amherst, uh, where I'm where I was a uh, inspector for thirty years, um, we we always looked at it like um, if if a developer was coming to develop a piece of property and he needed a hydrant to service that, and it was a municipal one, he would pay you know bear the cost to install the hydrant. The minis the uh, Erie County Water System then would pick up the maintenance of it from there on out. Right. But it still was their responsibility as a developer to get that hydrant there. Yeah. To fish to it's, fish yeah. serve their building. So it, even if you could get one there, you know, even if you get one off a six inch, six inch line, eight inch line, yeah. you know, whatever. But I, I'm guessing this hydrant system is you know, it's something it probably is just leaking everywhere. And uh, you know, from our perspective, relying on someone being in the right spot at the right time to turn a valve so that there's water to put out the fire at the school right. is problematic in the context of considering a, a, a variance to add more square footage and pile more people into that well, building. What they told us is they won't use the system. I mentioned that, but they, they won't use it. They'll fight it with their pumper truck is how their fire plan is. I mean, for they, have to, they have to bring water in from who knows where. Yeah. And yeah. you know tankers or whatever, but it, it's a yeah. whole other process. You know? Yeah. And what's the size of the the school itself? Well, it's it's uh, it's a BOCI, so and it has uh, multiple buildings. So I mean the the student population on a daily basis is about four hundred and fifty students, um, and in two, you know, it's split over two periods. Like they have a morning session and an afternoon session. I mean, my 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 concern is. A pumper truck shows up with what, fifteen hundred gallons? Not even, probably not even five hundred, seven hundred at the most. Five hundred gallons of water, and yeah. that lasts about two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's not nothing else there. And hopefully, someone can find somebody to go turn the magic valve. Right. And and hopefully, yeah. then the hydrant work. I mean, right. it's right. very difficult for this yeah. board to look at, you know, adding square footage 
in, in that context. So, I mean, just, to, I mean, obviously there's schools all over New York state without a hydrant system. I'm not a firefighter, but how do they I actually don't that? know that I don't know if that's true. I can't say that's true. I mean, oh, I'm, I'm sure they have yeah. wells. I'm sure they have drafting pits, you know, drafting. They have to have something, a new, a new school. I'm not speaking of an older school. I can't speak to that, but yeah. or any new school or any school that goes back even, I mean, talking the fifties when you had the fatal fires in schools, ever since then schools have been built better than any building anywhere. Yeah, fire, no, I, I, fire protection and, and things like that. I've so. been doing schools for 20 years. Yeah. And a lot of our clients are rural clients and they. There has to be have... some provision, either tankers, you know, that they, the system where they bring in a tractor trailer full of, of right, uh, water, right. you know, I mean, they're, they, they have a system. There's something there to provide yeah. water. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, and we don't have any information in front of us about that. So that's right. what I'm saying. You know, whether it's fixing the hydrants or, as Mr. Andrews is saying, uh, presenting us, a, a, you know, a thought out detailed plan that shows that there's. Arguably, uh, adequate fire protection puts us in a, a, you know, a better position to consider a variance request like yeah. this than we would otherwise yeah. have today. Well, I'll, I'll pursue that. I, I know our challenges are that the state doesn't allow. A school district or VOCES to spend money off property. So that becomes another issue, right? So then we were subject to working with the municipality to and to their funding resources to fix this. Um, and um, what they told me, and I could get in more detail on their firefighting plan, but is that they they activate the hydrant system if there was an emergency and they would connect to it. Well, no guarantee, you know. I mean, right, I know. Guarantee. Yeah. So, what what about the fire officials down there? The fire marshal, a code official, they're on board. Yes. With, well, they it's, the, it's the, not their jurisdiction. That's it's the state the, of New York. Um, the state is a school, private school, public school. Yeah, sure the public school. So the, the building school. permits issued by uh, state education department. For Which I can't training. believe. I, you know, I'm shocked that they didn't even address that one way or the other. You know, to, to at least let us know. You know, I mean, yeah. thank God you did let us know. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're fair and honest. I, 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 I appreciate, I appreciate yeah. that. You know, but. They didn't even mention that, which is, yeah. you know, you're, you're, we're just exacerbating the, the, the situation by adding on something else that needs another variance for, for fire protection, right. which we don't even have fire protection to begin with. Right, right. Mr. Chairman, it's Peter uh, Clayman. Uh, could, um, could the petitioner come back to us with information from uh, local fire officials? Sure, yeah. Uh, and how, you know, on, on their letterhead, how they plan on fighting the fight. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to hear from state ed too. I'd like them to address the situation. In, in right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, <laughs> I, right. I, I would like them to address it because I can't believe that they would just give yeah, yeah. our blessing. Go ahead. Well, they, to be fair, um, I'm not sure how much of this hydrant situation has been made, they've been made aware of, you know, I, I have to check that. What they did comment on was the sprinkler um, variance that we've requested. That's I where see. our communication with them is. And as, um, as our attorney said that, you know, we really just before us is that petition, but I, I just in good conscience can, you know, understand. Okay. So let's, um, are, are you going to withdraw the petition at the moment? I, it sounds like I, I should, because I don't want to run the risk of it being denied. Um, because even if we do get the hydrants working, we still have a, a problem with enough pressure to do an automatic restraint. Right. Just mm -hmm. um, I'm confident that'll be an issue. So sure. yeah, I'd like to withdraw. Uh, can, uh, Mr. Chairman, can I ask the petitioner a couple questions about what we see on the prints sure. that are germane to today? would be applicable to seeing you say next month sure. or next two months uh i i'm uh curious um because of the size of the font i'm in, in a rough way um what is the occupancy uh for a like a dance or uh uh, or, yeah. uh using the stage or something uh, our like maximum that? occupancy is um for that situation and i think we listed it in there, but it's 900. Let me see here. Let me just go to the plan there. We a couple things have changed on that plan, but 
I, I don't think it changes our, um, our approach. We got 468 on each side. So that would be, what is that? 18, 18, 36, 936 is our total occupancy. What's that, using seven square foot? Yes. Seven square foot, all right. I can't imagine uh, given, well, I can't imagine more than seven square foot even in a school dance. Right, right. No, no, and, and, and they, I mean, if it's at Volsey's, they don't have an event like that, but they might have like a graduation. That's why we wanted to size it for that purpose. Oh. Where they're going to check chairs and so yeah. on. Fortunately, it's a public resource and there right. could yeah. be a very good reason to have a, a gathering there. Yeah. And, and, and so that's part of our concern over the long haul. And then I have a, a kind of an odd question. Uh, I understand it appears as if there's only one leaf in the fire separation between the two buildings, only yes. one door. Yes. And that indicates that you just don't have a lot of people transversing. Right. right. The um, the other building is very small, um, and like I had mentioned there, that this campus is multiple buildings. Mm -hmm. So the more majority of the students coming to this gymnasium are coming from outside directly in, uh, because there it, it's almost it's more like a college campus setup where there's a lot of external circulation between the buildings. Right. So that, so that if, um, I can, okay, thank you. Yeah. That answers my question. So with the 900 occupancy, yeah. are you still at 50% more for exit? Yes, that's, still that's what we okay. did it for, yeah. Good. Yeah. And then uh, as, as, long, as long as we probably are gonna rehear this again, um, I would throw some things out to you. There is a stage, right? If I'm not correct. Yeah, very small stage. Okay. It, uh, does it come under the requirements of a stage to be sprinkler? No, it doesn't. It does not. Okay. Yeah. So my thought process and when I was looking at this, just as the gymnasium, um, would you be, would you object to putting um, sprinkler heads in over the stage and in the storage areas? I mean, you could run those off your domestic water. You've got to have decent domestic water because you've got, you know, bathrooms, and toilets. Or I, I, toilets. I think we would be in the situation if we if we did any sprinkler system, we would have to have a fire pump. No, this would this would be a residential sprinkler, not residential, a, a limited area sprinkler system. It would be off the domestic water. It wouldn't require because it would only probably be one head or two heads in those areas that I'm speaking of individually. They would go off. It's not like we would have, uh, you know, 15 heads going off at once. So it's it's something that would be plumbed in just with, along with your normal plumbing. Um, it's just something I'm, I was throwing, I would throw out there as a suggestion, you know, if we, we heard this. All right, I'm, I'm something to nervous consider. about it. I, we'll, we'll definitely yeah, consider it. Because like I said, it, um, you're, you're talking very limited amount of pressure and, and volume yeah. that they need at that area. Yeah, I just know that where I've, I've had situations before where I I haven't had the pressure and I, and I had a stage that was larger and I had to right, provide right. sprinkler just for the stage, I still had to do a fire pump. Right, okay. And, I, I, you know, just my personal opinion yeah. from these limited sprinkler heads that that stage looks like it's, you know, probably can be covered by two heads. Yeah. You know, and then the individual storerooms, um, it's just something to, uh, to consider when you come back, that's all. May I ask you another question, Peter Klayman here? Uh, do I see door leaks in front of the stage? Does that mean there's storage underneath the stage? There is, and it's um, storage just for chairs and tables, mm -hmm. which is allowed um, for this instance without a sprinkler system under there. Yeah, okay. So then... Uh, uh, um, Very short. You know, yeah. it's, no, I understand that, but, yeah. but unfortunately... Um, uh, uh, how do I say this politely? Uh, are the the access doors to that area one hour rated as well? I mean, are we looking at the storage area being in its own one hour box, even though it's a cost space? Just curious. Um, because that storage under stage would well, first of all, the whole area would have had to have been sprinkled, which meant that area would have had to be sprinkled. Correct, but right. you understand right. the right. storage yeah. under stage is, are, is a classic, classic okay. uh, long term fire protection problem. Yep. And, and again, this is all hypothetical because you know, I, and I, these are all things that we, if you can address these ahead of time, we, yeah. Okay. And and I, I think it would, if the doors are required to be rated for storage, yeah. then I'm confident they are. Okay. 
Understood completely. Okay. Just, just the whole yeah. idea. Is that what you're those asking? Those questions are going to come up. Yeah. If, yeah. We, if you come back, and yeah. it would be very helpful for the board that you prepared for them. I guess I just want to be clear about something: is you're not asking it to be rated if the code doesn't require it, but if the code does require it, we want it rated. Or, uh, or uh, um, at this point in time, you should be ready to offer any manner of mitigation. Gotcha, uh, Rick. See exactly because it would have been required to be sprinkled be under the situation that you have here. This if whole building is required. Oh, that's and that that's would require them to have sprinklers there. Sorry about that. Man. Now that you're asking for no sprinklers, that area underneath, you can check the sprink the uh, stage section, and I know there's uh, square footage parameters that determine whether or not things have to be sprinklers. Right. But um, I don't think this. I think the storage has to be also. So that. And I, I believe it is. I just there. wasn't prepared yep. to mention it. That's fine. Yeah. And and taking storage out. Storage off the table under the stage is another option. Right. I'm not saying right. that your client would, would put up with it, but that yeah. that that enhances our understanding of the safety of this bill. Yeah, well, I'm looking it's for, a, for for well, you know something to throw at us that and you've already with 50 percent of the of the exiting is, is important to us. You know that's yeah, love. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, another question, sir, Peter Crane again. Um, are the bleachers movable? The bleachers have been removed from the project. We're not um, putting them in. They were they were designed as um, as uh, extended and stackable, so they're fixed to the wall and they would extend out. But um, they don't have budget to do them, so they've been removed. Also, the folding partition has been removed from the project because of budget concerns. Yeah, and then. Uh, 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 I'm not so sure, Rick, that the bleachers provide any kind of fuel. If um, yeah, depending on the usually they're constructed of steel now today. Oh, yeah, yeah the, the frame, the, the seats are plastic, but it's class A. Yeah. Oh, all the materials will be class A. Then, then yeah. by all means, be ready to uh, mention that for the future. Yeah. 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 Mr. Because Chairman, we would, I would... Want, we would want to restrict that in our findings Correct. If, Correct. if your client wants bleachers in the future. Right. Same with the stage, you know, curtains, things like that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I could suggest that we adjourn this rather yep. than, yeah. No, nope. rather than, uh, yeah. so uh, just to be clear, uh, you're withdrawing the petition for consideration today? Well, we're just, we're just adjourning it. We're okay. adjourning it. So we're adjourning it. Is that, <laughs> oh, thank is that you. acceptable? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. That way you don't have today. to file it because you're perfect. I'm sure you'll hear back from staff about to uh, uh, another meeting soon. Yeah. And, and Who's going to make a motion to adjourn? Uh, I'll make a motion. Yeah, I'll, I'll just make so, uh, Rick Andrews. I make a motion that we adjourn this so petition until John Shetty. I'll second that motion. Okay, uh, all in favor, Mr. Andrews. Aye, Mr. Shetty. Yes, Mr. Cleaner. Yes, David Flynn votes yes. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. That's it. The petition is in <laughs> 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 just and, um, Thank you for being forthright about the, yes. about, about yes. the availability of water. Yes, it is. That uh, is to your professional. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. All right, next petition 2023-0040, Chickawaga Mary, Maryville, UFSD Canvas. <laughs> Nature of grievance and relief sought. The petition requests a variance regarding additions to an existing building. This application is for a building of type 2B of group B e occupancy. The building consists of two stories and has a gross area of approximately 196,324 square feet. The building is located at 1050 Maryvale Drive, Town of Chitawaga, County of Erie, State of New York. Petition seeks relief from 19 NYCRR 1221, the 2020 Building Code of New York State, section 903.2.3, an automatic sprinkler system shall be provided for Group E occupancies as follows. One, throughout all Group E fire areas greater than 12,000 square feet in area. Two, the Group E fire area is located on a floor other than a level of exit discharging discharge serving such occupancies. 
exception in buildings where every classroom has not fewer than one exterior exit door at ground level, an automatic sprinkler system is not required in any area below the lowest level of exit discharge serving that area. The Group E fire area has an occupant load of 300 or more. Petitioner requests relief from providing a sprinkler system. Please identify yourself and present your. My name is Rob Smith Bell with Young and Wright. I am here on behalf of Maryville. I have the facilities director, um, Charles Mind, with me. Um, I have additional exhibits to, um, they're basically just enlarged plans. They're a little easier to read than full size prints. And I also um, have full, I also have included a letter of sign off from SEB supporting this variance. Which is at the very end of the document. So, as it as the variance mentions, uh, we have an existing building um, that uh, was not broken down into fire zones. We were tasked with enlarging the gym by taking over some of the uh, the space throughout the building, and in doing so, we are separating the gym from the rest of the. Uh, existing building to create its own building area that is also separated um, by fire zones, i.e. the storage spaces are all uh, fire rated and the bathrooms and everything that are associated with that space. Right. We, in addition to this project, we have a addition that is also touching that space, which will be separated by firewalls as well. Um, <clears throat> okay. What's, what's the estimated budget cost for the whole project? This project is around, it, well, it, the original budget cost was much lower, but we're at right now about 20 million because of escalation costs um, over the uh, last three years. And what do you think the uh, variance would save you? Uh, this, we're gonna save over a half a million dollars um, due to the fact that the, we do have hydrants surrounding the building. They do have proper pressure. <laughs> Just check. Yes, we, sir. Have water, so we do have water. <laughs> we do have water. Um, the uh, the cost to it is the pump system to pump to that height of the gymnasium, um, which would also need a compressor system to uh, to add to that. Um, according to the code, that all needs to be powered by a generator that is diesel. The district dis district's generator is electric, but or I guess gas served, but it is also does not have the capacity to add on this additional system. My firm does a lot of sprinkler design and uh, back for preventer design. This is a ground floor gym, right? Yes. What kind of pressure do you have? The water system there. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, How tall is have, this gymnasium building? The gymnasium is twenty-eight feet. I mean, well, I'm sorry. I it's it's their in their office. That's well within the normal uh, pressure that's supplied. You're, you're probably out of your retirement water authority right there. Yeah, it's, yeah they, they have good pressure at almost all their beds. It surprises me that you would need a fire pump. For something this size in that area, our engineers did do a full calculation test, and they, um, unfortunately, I don't have that in front of me, the test data in front of me, but we did do a full calculation of this space. And they said because of the height of the gymnasium, um, they weren't able to get the, the pressure there for that area. It's <laughs> very is that driven in part by the number of the head? The head? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the bottom of structure is, I'm sorry, is at the 27 feet. Okay. The, the actual structures of the trusses of themselves bring the roof up an additional eight feet. Eight feet. That, that should be well within I think so. the pressure that's supplied there. So just walk me through the, um, what, what's actually being added on and what's actually so, there. So the brown area, so I'm sorry, the first to your left is the existing floor plan of the 
of the building. There was an addition in 2007 where they added the natatorium, um, and we believe there is a fire proper firewall there. Um, the area in pink is our new gymnasium area that we are separating from the uh, existing building uh, through the use of firewalls. There is a small area that's outlined in black that triggers us as an addition. Um, it's less, it's around 900 square feet. And then the brown area is all new. Nope. Is all new. So the gymnasium is, you're using the existing gymnasium, but you're just, a, you're expanding it. Yes, the existing gymnasium takes over the locker rooms that were the existing locker rooms, and it comes out past the old corridor. So we've relocated the corridor in a new addition outside of that space. And what's the total square footage of that gymnasium now? So the gymnasium itself is 11,600. So it's under 12,000. It's under 12,000. But they, do they use it for dancing? <laughs> That's what gets you into the higher above the higher capacity. The bleachers themselves will have uh, will occupy seating of like 700. But it looks like the new gymnasium would be 19,364. That is the building area. So that would include all those auxiliary oh, spaces. It includes all of that. So all the brown, the, right? All, well, the brown is is the addition piece. Okay. The building area for the gymnasium, there are storage rooms in there and restrooms. Those are have been broken up through the use of fire barriers to separate them from that. So if you look at the outside perimeter of the gymnasium, that is 19, mm -hmm. but that includes the different fire zones, the blue, the green, and the purple fire zones. Okay. That's how you get to that. But the gym proper is 11,600. Peter's playing on here. Once the, uh, I guess it's red. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, mm -hmm. kind of behind the eight ball when it comes to call it uh, cross hatched area uh, outlined in that. Black. That is the area that technically fell outside of the original footprint that triggered this ah, being an addition. You. Thank you. Thank you. It's nine hundred square feet of the eleven or the nineteen and uh, nineteen three sixty three. So. So, but the 11,000 in, in the black or brown area is addition, right? Yes, that is an addition, which is also separated from the other buildings via uh, soil rats. And then there's, that's a two-story? That is a two-story. We are providing sprinkler. We were able to get sprinkler protection and pressure for that second floor. The gymnasium, including the gymnasium, put us over the, the requirements. So you are sprinkling certain. We parts. are sprinkling the second floor of the addition, the brown area. Okay, why wouldn't you do the first floor? That is not required. Okay. Per the well, it's not required, but you're asking for a variance. So, and that's an exit corridor, right? The yes, a big exit corridor, right to the lobby, right? Yes. So would there wouldn't be so would there be an objection to having us require you to sprinkle that area? I guess I would have to review that with the owner. Right. And you, what about exiting? Are you providing more than it? Yes, is? I don't have the exact number over, but we are over by a percentage of the uh, occupancy of that gym. And by the looks of it, you really don't have any place other than this one wall here, which would be the, uh, I don't know which wall it would be, but. North would be up. So. Okay, so it would be your east wall where you could actually put some more exits if if we require something like that um, to get you into like a maybe a fifty percent. I can look at that. Because um, what I'm seeing for actual exits looks like the lobby's well covered, mm -hmm. uh, but if you go out the back side, it looks like there's one one single door. And then it looks like you, is that a, uh, a fire separation or is that just a smoke separation? Smoke no separation. To okay. Allow the and then where is the next exits out of that? So there is exiting out through um, just looks, to the left of the green. That looks like a single door also. Yes. 
So how are you getting, uh, how are you meeting your requirements there? Looks like you might be, you know, you're getting the people out of the gymnasium, but you may not be getting them uh, larger, a larger percentage out of the building. That's my question. Something you might have to visit. Because it doesn't look to me like that, you know, you don't, you have all single doors out the back end or the north end. South end, you're, you're obviously covered pretty good, but everybody's going in that one direction of the lobby. Is that correct? The, the main entrance? Yes. So you're not sending them to the west at all? To the west, uh, there is exiting through a different fire zone. That is, those doors do swing out? Yes, they can swing out. So, okay. So it looks like you're exiting um, from the gymnasium. Is might be so you don't know what that number is though, as far as percentage you do. <laughs> Not off the top of my head. Because we certainly, as you heard from the last one, it was fifty percent over. Okay. You know the number of people. <laughs> so that would certainly be a concern. Um, it, I do like the fact that you're, you've rated it all the way around and you've done some more ratings in there, looks like on these other places. Yes, we put those other other zones into smaller zones to put that. So the fitness center, so the fitness room looks like that's glass. So there's, is there rating there? The, the, the only glass is on the exterior. Oh, okay. Because that looks, I mean, what, what that, what that is. That's the structural columns there. Okay. We did not bury them in walls. That, that's what it is. And my, my issue with that is, is that without the sprinklers, that's the rate, should be a rated corridor. It is a rated corridor. It is. That, that wall would be rated? Yes, that wall would be and one the doors, and the doors, that, yeah. whatever. Yes. Quarter. We, yeah, in, we, we have. have the doors are three quarter hour. We would have one hour protection at the corridor level. Okay. And then that fitness center is separated. But if you sprinkle it, that's even better yet for me, as far as I'm concerned. The first floor, that area, the exit corridor going out to the main entrance. Okay. You guys have questions? Yeah. Uh, there... I, uh, it's Peter Plainman here again. Uh, given that. Um, you have to decide whether you're going to, um, um, you know, come back in a month or two months or whether you're going to, you're going to have, it, have it there. I have a, a, a vote today. It would be in your best interest uh, if you're going to come back to uh, think about uh, mitigation and, and uh, partial sprinkler systems go a long way on exit corridors to mitigate in the school. And that could very well, in my mind, I don't know, Rick, uh, well, would it be helpful if the if the corridor to the north? Yeah, yeah. Is, the corridor. Is I mean, it, it, now that you say that they are offering a sprinkler mm -hmm. in, in certain areas, um, going along with John or, originally, there there's certainly going to be enough pressure to provide that mm -hmm. corridors. And I mean, I'm even looking into these what these blue things are inside the gymnasium itself. Are they locker rooms? Or it's they... it's storage and locker rooms. Yeah, so I mean, I, I even like to see storage rooms covered by, you know, then, you know, whatever happens in there happens and stays in there, you know, it's not going to go. I mean, I, the only reason I, I wrote this down is uh, uh, Cleveland Hill fire. I don't have to tell you, yeah. you know, people yeah. that, you know, and that's, I don't know if that was that particular district, but it was in that certain, certainly in that area. And, um, you know, we have a couple of firefighters that live the main transit fire and neighbor, neighboring fire department that were in that fire. And, you know, it's, you know, and this goes back to the last case. Um, when it comes to schools, um, just don't want to mess around. Daycare centers, you know, those are the things that I personally don't want to mess around with. So if we can, I, I would think that we would like to adjourn this one also to let you go back and come back with this. Was your decision? I mean, it's certainly your decision, but I would like you to go or, or we could, or we could, Pass it with conditions that the the exit corridors be sprinklered and the first floor be sprinklered, and then at least it would make me feel a lot more comfortable at that point. I mean, that's up to you. I guess um, 
So you're referring to that north corridor? The north corridor, the, and, then, and then the obviously the, the green, the brown area, okay. I mean, the brown exit corridor. South corridor, corridor. south corridor. Yeah. Do you, you, you want to it? take a moment and call state ed? Well, state ed. Well, it's not it's really, state ed, it's, it's okay. not the state ed. It's your client. It's my client. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 And I just can't see that being a huge number. Right. I can't see that being a huge number. Um, and it's certainly now, with that lobby been, being a two-story lobby, would you say that that would also need to be well it, is it an open two-story lobby it's and it's it's a two-story space it's not it's separated by firewalls from the right. surrounding areas so and yeah they would put heads at the top and so you got the second floor so i just so want to understand continue to sprinkle it out yeah. yeah so it would be exits there from you know okay. exit quarter and exits there from yes so the north quarter and the south quarter, the brown area, and then those storage areas. And you know, I mean, locker rooms aren't so important at this point, but because they're off to the side anyway, and they're rated. Uh, but those storage areas that are within the gymnasium, and then if you know, I mean, if that way, if we, if we could, uh, you know, if you don't adjourn it and we pass it, that would, as far as I'm concerned, that would be a condition that I would ask for. Do we, can, can, yeah, can we, can we, can we take we a minute and call the, the superintendent? And, we can take a break. Yeah. Uh, we'd appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. We don't have the authority yeah, okay. to, uh, to say that. No, and like I said, I don't think it's going to be a huge number. Right. So, yeah. uh, so we'll just take a motion, a motion to go off the record. We're going to go off the record and a motion. <laughs> New gentleman had an opportunity to speak with your uh, your client. Yes, and um, the owner would like to proceed um, with um, sprinkling the offering up sprinkling the first floor for exit corridors in relief um, for that variance of the gymnasium itself. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else here who wants to speak on this matter? Um, do you have anything else you want to add? You're good? No. Okay. Um, so we'll ask everyone to step out. Going off the record, please. The record. Okay. So uh, the, the board has been in deliberation regarding your request for the variance. And we're of a mind that we really need some additional information in order to proceed. Uh, you know, with the with the variance, um, and we're prepared uh, to adjourn um, to allow you know you to do that and come back at our you know one of our next hearing dates. Um, but right now, we feel like we don't have enough information to adequately assess the request for the variance, and and therefore would likely have to deny it. And the the information we're looking for relates to the claims of um, excessive economic burden. So we don't we don't have anything in front of us um, upon which to assess that and to look at that. And so we would want to see, you know, from a, a, a reputable um, engineer architectural firm and the fire protection safety space, you know, their assessment as to what the cost would be for meeting the code requirements for sprinkling. And then there was also a, uh, an indication that there may be some limitation on the water supply system, that this would cause a stress on the municipal water supply system was in, in some of the documents. And we would we need and want to understand what that is, whether that's from uh, your engineering folks or some, some indication from the Erie County Water Authority or something that there's some limitation and pressure or line size or something like that, that would preclude um, this uh, a sprinkler system from being installed. Uh, you know, we're looking at the size of the building, the height of the building, the professional judgment of a number of the folks here is that the, it just, there, it doesn't seem that this should be a problem in terms of sprinkling that size building at that height. Uh, in the middle of Chief Duaga. Now, that doesn't mean that isn't the case, but we need to understand and we need to have a basis upon which to make our findings. Um, so that's what we're looking for. Gentlemen, do you have any 
need to add to that. Specifically, I'd like to see the justification for the fire pump. I have that. If I just don't have it with me, but we do have okay. the calculations and everything that was done prior to this. So, but I can um, provide that. Okay, great. Especially if you can provide it to Andy in advance so we can look yeah. at it. Yeah, so I need like seven copies again so we can give it to the board so they all have it. So at this time, we make a motion to adjourn. Yes. No. Can I ask a question? So in the, I have to review this with the owner. Sure. Um, because also, uh, t timing of the project is also a big concern, um, which is not anything that worries about you guys. No, but it has a financial impact on the district on whether or not they can or cannot do the project. Um, if timing is pushed out another three months, so they may ultimately decide to withdraw petition in effort to not I, I don't know when your next hearing is next hearing is in it was every two months for the Buffalo board yeah. so, so it's April April, April. Okay. Okay. early April yeah early third Wednesday of April third Wednesday okay third third yeah you guys need the third So we'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that we adjourn this petition. A second. I'll make a motion to second. We adjourn the petition. Okay. All in favor, Mr. Andrews. Yes. Mr. Shannon. Yes. Mr. Kling. Yes. David Flynn votes in the affirmative. Support adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you. If they elect to withdraw the petition, is that just a formal letter to? Yeah, it's a formal letter. Okay. And we can help you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Me too. <laughs>Okay. Are we uh, are we ready to go? You're good. Okay. Okay. Petition number twenty twenty two dash zero five nine nine. Agree party is Matthew Pohl or Collie. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it appropriately. Um, nature of grievance and relief sought. The petition pertains to a variance for an existing fire apparatus access road that is less than the allowable width of 20 feet, which is a private road and serves eight single family residences and is known as 121 Hillcrest Drive, located in the town of Ithaca, County of Tompkins, New York State. The public notice was published in the New York State Register, November 23, 2022 issue. Petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code, Section 503.4, Obstruction of Fire Apparatus Access Roads, which states that fire apparatus access roads shall, shall not be obstructed in any manner, including the parking of vehicles. The minimum widths and clearances established in Section 503.2.1 and 503.2.2 shall be maintained at all times. 503.2.1 dimensions fire apparatus access road shall have an unobstructed width of not less than 20 feet. Petitioner is seeking relief for a variance to an existing fire apparatus access road, which is a private road that was established prior to the 1940s and has a reduce, uh, reducing the drive lane of approximately 13 feet wide. Is the petitioner online or available? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you please identify yourself and uh, present your petition? Great. Uh, my name is Matthew Cole. I'm A T T H I E U, and Cole is C O L L E. I am the petitioner for uh, 2022 0599. And uh, if uh, if it's okay with you, I'd like to share just a quick presentation on uh, on the case. Okay.
All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing me to present today. Uh, I know last time we had some technical difficulties, so I want to thank you and your IT department for uh, allowing uh, a better situation today. It's much easier to present and, uh, and hear everybody in the room. So um, this case, specifically 121 Aircrest Drive, it's a house we're building currently about 65% complete. You can see the 121 here. Um, Aircrest Drive, it is a private dead end roadway on a sloping hill in the town of Ithaca. It's a single track road. Uh, and uh, currently we're about 65% complete on uh, on the house. Oh, wrong way, okay. Um, the road has been in existence since the 1950s. Uh, the town of Ithaca provided us with documents, uh, deeds and other, uh, other couple of documents that I can share with you, uh, proving that it was already uh, in place since the 50s. And as you can see here, there's uh, different uh, parcels on it. Also on this map, uh, tax parcel, we can see that there's eight existing family dwellings. And 105, the first one on the right here, was built in 1900. 107 next to it in 1953. 117 in 1954. 131, 136 in 1957. And 130, 125, and 127 right here were built uh, in the 80s. And again, 121 is where we are uh, building currently. Uh, all the houses are close, fairly, uh, are built fairly close to the road. Um, again, it's, it's you know, a, a very specific uh, road in the, in the town of Ithaca. Uh, I took some pictures that uh, were part of an exhibit that I submitted last year in November. Uh, the road, is, as I said, is a, is a dead end. There's a large turnaround at the end of the, of the private road. Uh, the, um, the reason why we're um, asking for an appeal is that um, it does not exceed 13 feet approximately at the narrowest points, um, it, which I took a picture here. And we think that due to the nature of the road, the sloping sides and the proximity of the existing dwellings, uh, making it wider to 20 feet would be uh, physically impractical, impractical for, um, you know, and, and also a, a problem with uh, with our neighbors, uh, and it would be a, a massive, unreasonable economical uh, burden. So we are seeking relief from uh, Section 503 of the New York State 2020 uh, Fire Code um, today. And thank you for your attention. So it's Rick Andrews speaking, board member for fire safety. Um, number one, the 503.4. I don't think there's the right section that you're really, the variance is really for because uh, 503.1.1 building facilities for fire apparatus access roads has exceptions on it, which it says one and two family detached dwellings or not more than two group R3 occupancies that meet the requirements of section 511. So that throws you to 511 and right, right off the bat, in the first exception under 511, it says construction of dwellings on premises which have a local site plan approval prior to January 1st, 2011, with no modifications to the approved site plan, would not require the emergency access road. So I, have you looked at that section? No, I, I, I'm personally not an expert in the New York State uh, Fire Code. I, I was um, directed to it from the Town of Ithaca Code Enforcement Team, which I believe is also on the call today, and thank you for that. Uh, they, they provided the, the actual section um, of the code, so I, I trusted them uh, 100% on that. Well, it seems that you've shown documentation that this site plan was approved prior to January 2011. Is that correct? Uh, are you talking about the actual road or the zoning the site, or the, the site, building the, uh, site with all the, with all the different um, building sites on it? Subdivision. Uh, yes. Subdivision. I mean, That's those right. those 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 plots of land have been there since what you said. I don't even. How long ago was that established? Uh, at least the 50s. The plot from the document provided by the town of Ithaca. Okay. 
So, I mean, that's where I'm at with it. I, unless the code official can come up with something else, doesn't sound to me like you need a variance. It might need to be, uh, I, this is Tom Petula, Department of State. It may end up being a variance slash appeal. Because they might be appealing the I got you. town of uh, Ithaca's vote Des decision. Correct. I'm sorry, who's speaking? This was Tom Danielle, Tom Petula, Department of State. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, I was going to say, uh, I, I understand a code official is on today. I am on at this present time. My name is Marty Mosley. I'm the director of code enforcement for the town of Ithaca at 215 North Tioga Street, Ithaca, New York, 14850. Thank you for joining us. Can you uh, enlighten us and give us a sense of uh, the community's view? Well, I would say, in all honesty, that I overlooked the exception dealing with the site plan of January 1, 2011. Uh, that did not come to my attention until you just pointed it out. Um, we had been dealing with these in different areas of the town and it might have been oversight on my part to be completely honest. Well, having said that, um, how are you, are there fire hydrants, fire hydrants on this road? Uh, there is a fire hydrant about 100 foot away from the mouth of it. I've been in communication with our engineering department to see if they can modify the system to actually put it at the mouth of the private road. And that would give you the, the required distances? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Good. Well, then, I don't think we have an issue then. Yeah, I, I agree. So, um, right now we're looking at this as a, a kind of a hybrid variance uh, and uh, an appeal of the code uh, code officer's decision. Um, just, I'm asking now the code officer, are you? Um, are you comfortable with the uh, the analysis and determination that the, the variance is, is not required? Yes, since I'm the one that actually supplied all the documents from the town to the applicant to supply to you for uh, with relation to the site plan approval. Yes. Okay, so if, um, if there's no longer a, a decision of the code officer to uh, to appeal, and the variance is not required, um, I, I would ask the petitioner to withdraw the petition um, in light of the code officials uh, determination. Okay, this is uh, Matthew Core here. You would like to receive a formal letter like mentioned at the previous case? No, because this is Tom to a department state. Um, Mr. Mosley from the town of uh, Ithaca has stated in testimony that there is no violation because it's a pre-existing non-conforming condition because the site plan approval was prior to 1980 and therefore is not subject to the requirements of having a 20 foot wide fire access road. So you don't need to do anything other than um, withdraw your petition for a variance slash petition um, appeal, Mr. Delay. Okay, uh, then, yeah, I would like to withdraw the application. Very good. Great. Okay, I think our work is done here. Thank you. Thank you uh, for participating. Um, you just need to change uh, the what? Motion to close the meeting. Yes. Can I have a motion to close our meeting? Also move. Second. Mr. Andrews, Mr. Shenny, second. Um, those in favor, Mr. Andrews? Yes. Mr. Shenny? Yes. Mr. Klingman? Yes. David Flynn votes in favor as well. The meeting and the hearing are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Off the record.